Hello and welcome to another episode of Into the Issues. I'm Steve Pappas. I will be your host. My guests today are Neil Van Dyke, who is the Search and Rescue Coordinator for the Vermont Department of Public Safety, right? Correct. Okay. There's a lot there are a lot of different variables there. And Brian Lindner, who is the uh, representing the Waterbury Backcountry Rescue, right? That's correct. You're the team leader. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you both for being here. I, uh, we've been going back and forth on this for a long time, trying to get everybody in the same room. And um, the reason I had wanted to have you on back in the summertime was when uh, there was an incident in, in Worcester, where um, on Worcester Mountain, where there was uh, somebody who had broken their ankle and there was, uh, there was difficulty in finding the right people to get up the mountain at the time. And uh, it, it raised uh, some issues for us at the newspaper, and I thought, well, this is actually a really interesting topic for all Vermonters to kind of get behind, not just central Vermonters, because um, you all are dealing with some really interesting kind of scenarios and challenges, and, uh, and it's important work that has changed a lot probably over the, over the years, even though search and rescue by itself is, you know, pretty straightforward. But talk a little bit, um, Neil, if you would, about what it is that you do and why, why do we need this in Vermont? Well, Vermont is pretty well known for its um, outdoor recreation activities, a uh, beautiful place to go out hiking, skiing, uh, snowmobiling, snowshoeing, and um, you know all of those, unfortunately, uh, Activities at times can uh, people can get lost or injured, and uh, there's uh, certainly been a demonstrated need for a response capability in the state to be able to, to provide a public safety service to to those recreational users. And this is a, an extension of what we already see as as rescue. I mean, every, every community kind of has its own, but. The specialty is here that you all have a certain skill set that allows you to perform certain duties, as you say, kind of out in the field. Right, huh. exactly. So um, and I think my own background as a volunteer would kind of be an example of that, where uh, I was a member of the Stowe Fire Department and the Ambulance Service in Stowe, and we had a couple of incidents in the late 1970s where people had uh, bad accidents uh, up in Smuggler's Notch. And the response at that point was to call the local fire department and the ambulance service. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, there really wasn't any specialized training that was available to, to deal with working safely in those environments. So in that case, uh, that community got together and created uh, what is now Stone Mountain Rescue to be able to more, more safely and effectively deal with those types of emergencies. But for many, many years, it relied on uh, typically fire department or, or ambulance service response. Yeah. Brian, it always comes down to everybody focuses on response time in these, in these cases, but we're talking about response time into some pretty rural kind of often very difficult spaces and you know I, the challenges of that are obviously are vast but what is kind of the demand that that your teams are seeing in in making these rescues you know I mean you're talking about woods you're talking about way back in the woods I think to a certain extent we are up against the public's perception that as soon as they call 911 a helicopter and paramedics are going to be immediately dispatched. And in Vermont, unfortunately, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You're generally looking at hours uh, mm -hmm. to be rescued, uh, whether you're sick or whether you're injured or lost. It's, it's really measured in hours. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in wanting to do this? Uh, I got involved because uh, as an EMT in Waterbury Ambulance, we found in the mid-90s um, that we were being called to some of these rescues where the fire department We'd empty, out, we'd empty out the fire department to go up the mountainsides and we'd park an ambulance at the base waiting for them to bring a patient down so that we had a lack of ambulance and a lack of fire protection during these long rescues. 
So uh, we started looking at Waterbury Ambulance and forming our own team, mm. separate, sort of separate from the ambulance, to do the rescues, leaving the ambulance in-house, leaving the fire department in-house until the patient is at the trailhead. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how many of these teams are there around the state? There are probably uh, eight to ten, maybe a dozen. Many of them are, uh, as Brian described, embedded into local fire departments or, e or EMS agencies. Uh, but where they've been able to do specialized training so that they really have the equipment and, and training to be able uh, to respond. Mm -hmm. And Brian, you're a team leader and, and active in it, and, and you are as well, Neil, but you are in your role as the state coordinator. You're overseeing kind of what all these teams are, are doing, not the dispatching per se, but right. you're keeping track of how many members there are, and I'm assuming helping to coordinate them on training? So my role really is uh, as a state employee to uh, uh, probably best be described as be the interface between uh, the public or state um, sort of statutory responsibility um, and coordinating with these local responses which are typically kind of first on scene. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we just feel it's really important to have a coordinated response so that each organization knows what's expected of the other. And it's just, we're fortunate in Vermont because we're such a small state. Mm -hmm. So we all kind of get to know each other, uh, which make things, makes things go much more smoothly. So a lot of my time is spent on outreach, helping to provide training and resources uh, to some of these local folks as, as well as um, you know, working to enhance the state's capabilities to respond. And these teams are typically centered around mountain bases, essentially. Right, yeah, I would say that's that's definitely true. That tends to be, if you look at uh, sort of a plot graph of where we get these incidents in Vermont, it's pr pretty clearly along the spine of the Green Mountains. So that's where um, most of the recreation takes place, most of the incidents take place, and uh, for a volunteer organization to be sustainable, there really has to be enough uh, activity for them to, to keep interested and keep their skills up. So we have some, seen some teams that have tried to kind of start up in some of the more peripheral areas, and typically they, they don't last just because they can go a year or two without actually getting called, so mm -hmm. it's hard to sustain. Mm -hmm. Brian, how many folks are on your team? Officially, we have about 25. Mm -hmm. And how does it work? How, if you, if somebody from Waterbury wanted to be part of the team, um, how, how do they go about that? What kind of training do they need? And do they need anything before they even come to you? Well, in Waterbury, um, we're looking for someone that either works in town or lives in town. It's got to be one of the two. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they can go to the Waterbury Ambulance website and, and fill out an application there. And while we like to have EMTs, that's not really a requirement because we need, what we're really looking for is people experienced in the backcountry, uh, experienced in hiking, experienced in working in the dark, uh, mm. so that when we go out, um, they're ready for, because most of our rescues are at nighttime, for example, uh, we need them experience in being able to go out there. And if we can get them up to the EMT level at some point, that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. you, you jumped ahead to one of my questions about most common instances are probably at night. Is there a time of year when you see more instances than others? So uh, we do keep uh, statistics on that. Um, and the highest volume of calls is in the summer and fall. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's strictly a direct correlation to the number of people who are out there recreating. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, we see more, you know, July, August, September, even into October. Uh, and then we'll get another bump in a good snow season, you know, with people that are, are outdoors in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely the summer is busier. Certain kinds of, well, actually, let's differentiate. There's a difference between search and rescue. Right. Let's talk a little bit about sure. that. So in Vermont, um, we use the term search and rescue kind of generically to mean a lot of different things. Mm. Um, 
but it is defined in Vermont statute in Title 20 as persons who require, uh, who are lost or missing in the backcountry remote areas or waters of the state. So as far as the kind of jurisdiction and responsibility goes, there is a distinction between search, somebody who's lost or missing, and somebody who may require emergency medical care mm -hmm. who's in the backcountry. Uh, in many states, those jurisdictions are the same. So if you go to New Hampshire, uh, the Department of Fish and Game, the game wardens over there are responsible for both of those. Uh, in Vermont, it's split. So in Vermont, the uh, Department of Public Safety has jurisdiction and responsibility for those who are lost or missing. And then people who require medical service but are in a known location falls to the local level. Mm -hmm. So either a local search and rescue team or a local EMS agency or fire department. Mm -hmm. So falling back on the instance when I opened the show, I was talking about somebody in this this young woman in Worcester who had broken her ankle on the on the mountain. Like apparently, it was clear that the the injury was severe enough that didn't have to find her, but needed the assistance to get her down and. The part of the problem was, one, the time of year, I, I believe, it was hard to get whatever the local, I must admit, was the Worcester crew to the trailhead. And two, nobody on the trailhead, nobody from the crew felt that they could actually make the hike up to mm -hmm. get her. And somebody else, that the, so one of the backcountry teams had to be called to conduct the rescue. Um, and as you were saying, Brian, that is a response time of hours. That's mm -hmm. not a response time of, of, of something instant. Um, and do the local departments, can they just, or should they just be yielding and saying, that's, that's backcountry rescue, search and rescue. We, we, we probably shouldn't even take that if it's at a certain point on the mountain. I, I can speak to it in Waterbury, for example, where we have a, a memorandum of understanding with the fire department that when one of these calls come in, it automatically goes to Waterbury Backcountry Team mm -hmm. so that we we are then responsible for that response and the fire department stays in place mm -hmm. for fire protection. Um, they don't attempt to do these rescues anymore uh, like they used to back in the 90s, for example. Mm -hmm. I think it becomes a more challenging question in a community where you don't have an established search and rescue response yes. like you have in Waterbury and mm -hmm. Stowe and some other other communities. So I think it's a good question. I, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. In some situations, uh, if the subject isn't too far into the woods, local fire and EMS, they're there quickly. Mm. Uh, if they have some minimal level of training, they may be able to deal with the response, but I think uh, it's a very good point that they need to understand their limits uh, because we have seen situations where there's been a considerable dis delay when the initial responders get there and it takes them a while to figure out that it's really above their, mm -hmm. their capability. And um, uh, it, it, ideally that would sort of all be thought through and pre-planned uh, beforehand as to who's the closest resource, who are we going to call, what are our capabilities realistically and what aren't they. Well, and one of the other challenges that we're seeing, not just in Vermont, but nationwide, is that a lot of these volunteer departments are not seeing the kind of numbers that they used to have. So just by the sheer ability to get people to the scene is Absolutely. probably pretty tricky. Absolutely. Um, are you seeing that changes in uh, outdoor activity, for example? Um, you know, there, there's backcountry skiing, there's there's always been the hiking, but now we're seeing trail running and we're seeing um, kind of different kinds of sport than maybe we've seen in the past. And um, I'm assuming that with that comes different kinds of demands on the trails and probably different kinds of injuries, maybe, I don't know, more severe I, without going into the gory details. Um, is Has there been an evolution in in that or is the person who gets lost or the person who gets hurt is it usually just a plain old accident or misjudgment and it's not they were running too fast you shouldn't have jumped over the crevasse kind of a thing <laughs> um, well interestingly I um, 
the numbers don't show, I, I think the numbers do not reflect the increase in outdoor participation that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the few growth areas in the ski industry is backcountry skiing. I mean, if you look at sales of equipment and the growth of uh, different uh, backcountry ski areas and zones that are being developed in Vermont, but we really haven't seen a corresponding increase in search and rescue incidents. Not that there aren't any, but um, sometimes I find a little bit surprising. Mountain biking is another example. So mm -hmm. um, certainly some people fall and get hurt and need injured, but it, it seems to be less than one might expect. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the incidents that we deal with still are hikers. That's the biggest number. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a really good ski season, we'll have quite a few incidents with skiers, but they're typically what we refer to as side country skiers, so people who are lift access, going skiing in a ski area and then ski out of bounds mm -hmm. uh, and get in trouble. Um, so certainly a little bit. We're seeing more people participating in more activities, but uh, not to the degree that one might expect. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's Which good. Which is a good thing. Yeah, I was going to say Which that a good probably thing. means that people are actually showing some common sense and right. being right. responsible. Um, as far as the, the searches go, um, that often is a case of somebody being separated, somebody misjudging the, the, the time of the mm -hmm. day. And you were talking, Brian, about nighttime rescue. Um, that has to be the I would think the biggest challenge and especially in a wintertime situation probably the most panic panicking kind of rescue that you could be doing is that true I don't know if I would describe it as being panicky but uh, well, it's you're not panicky everybody uh, yeah. else around yeah. you yeah. Pay yes. are. Right. yeah yeah because we can't be panicky right um, yeah, nighttime is definitely a challenge and that's the vast bulk of our of our calls yeah um, we've had, for example, we've had 14 this year. Uh, only one was started and ended in daylight. Huh. Um, but nighttime is that's when we operate. And that's usually hikers. Pre uh, almost like exclusively hikers. Yeah. Th this year, for example, yes. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about so these teams are made up of volunteers for the most part, right? Uh, yes, certainly the the local. Uh, teams are volunteers at the state level. We have some, you know, paid folks that do it. But um, yes, uh, the vast majority of search and rescue work in Vermont is done by volunteers, yeah. which is true in most states. So, Brian, how does it work in with your team? Do you, um, even though you're volunteers, there have to be a there have to be costs associated with this and and training. How how is what you do essentially funded? For Waterbury, it's, it's privately funded. It, uh, it's a private nonprofit corporation. Uh, now, the municipalities of Waterbury, Duxbury, and Moortown uh, in the last year have started contributing towards the ambulance. Yep. Uh, the ambulance trustees gives the backcountry team an annual budget, uh, and that's how we're funded, uh, plus through donations. Yep, and uh, I believe that's the model for most of them around the state. Uh, yes, either yeah. private, as, as Brian said, yeah. or many of them are also actually municipal. Yeah. So they're part of the town government, so either falling under the kind of purview of the fire department, perhaps, which could be a municipal uh, organization. And uh, t I would say typically they also get some funding from the town, but also rely on private fundraising. Do you get anything for rescuing somebody? Uh, we have a slip that we give them uh, or their relatives that said we're an all-volunteer organization we uh, supported through donations um, small percentage or a reasonable percentage make donations mm -hmm. uh, the majority probably do not mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely one way that we try and raise funds and yeah. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it it, it really varies um, some organizations do, you know, formal fundraising efforts. Mm -hmm. Others rely on donations. Brian and I were just talking before the 
the show, there was a family that got lost skiing at Mad River 17 years ago, mm -hmm. and they send a donation every year to all of the organizations that were involved for the last 17 years. So wow. um, that can be very gratifying, you know, that yeah. you really realize you've made an impact on people's lives and, and that they appreciate the, the effort that folks have gone to. And others, on the other hand, the reality is some people you'll spend 12 hours dragging out of the woods and they get up, get in their car, drive away, and you never get a thank you from them. So mm -hmm. that's the exception, fortunately. Mm -hmm. So there's been this perennial arg debate, argument, that maybe we should, as a state, as I'm assuming it would be your department, mm -hmm. should charge folks to be rescued. Is that is that a legitimate debate? I, I think it's uh, it's not an uncommon debate to have. Uh, it takes place all over the country. Uh, I think different jurisdictions have different takes on it. Um, for the most part, the uh, I think the, the position of search and rescue folks, whether either paid professional or volunteer, is that they are generally not supportive of, uh, of charging for mm -hmm. the service that they view it as being sort of a basic public safety, just like you don't get charged. If you have a chimney fire in your house, you pay through it through taxes. You may make a donation to the local volunteer fire department. But the fear is that um, we don't want people to delay in calling for help for fear of getting a big bill. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the, the argument from the search and rescue perspective because the longer things go, uh, the more things are delayed, um, generally the poorer the outcome. So mm -hmm. we would rather find out sooner than later, not have people worried about whether they're going to get a big bill, and uh, we'll deal with the costs in other ways. So you get the call. Chances are somebody who has been out doing what they're doing is calling you from their cell phone. Two questions there. One is, should most people are out hiking to get away from their cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also a pretty valuable tool now because it's got so much technology in it um, with GPS and being able to track. And um, questions twofold can it be trusted for what you do? Are you getting an accurate reading of where somebody is? And should people actually be carrying cell phones? Or smartphones with them when they hike. Well, it, it's a it's a double-edged sword. Uh, it definitely has its advantages. Um, I think it also gives people a certain percentage a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. um, where we find the cell phone to be most helpful is if they say, for example, they're on Hunger Mountain and, and we're talking to them, and we've got a really good signal. In, one, in, in certain ways, because of experience, we know generally where they probably are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's even more true on Camel's Hump, and I'm sure it is all around the state, the same thing. The strength of their signal, in a way, gives us a solid clue as to where they are, because mm -hmm. often they have no clue. Mm -hmm. it's, that is a very interesting, you know, yeah. they, everyone complains about the cell service in Vermont, that may, may be the one one area where it's like, well, it's a weak signal, so we know, yeah. Yeah. or a strong signal, I guess. Um, but go ahead. So I think it's a, it's a good question. I think my feelings about it have changed over time, um, and I think in large part that's because the technology has changed. Uh, and I think telling somebody not to take a phone when they go hiking is kind of silly. They're going to take it anyway. Um, and I think the pros far outweigh the cons. I agree with Brian that there are times when we feel like people are underprepared because they have this safety net in their hand mm -hmm. and they know that help is only a 911 call away. Mm -hmm. And I think before that technology was available, people tended to think a little bit more about what they need to take to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the ability to get location information much of the time, to find out from them what the problem is. So from a medical treatment standpoint, knowing if somebody has a, a broken femur, or a strained ankle, or is feeling chest pain, can save us a lot of uh, 
weight in terms of what we have to carry in and understanding what the urgency is and the speed required and how many people it's going to take. So definitely a valuable resource. As far as kind of the uh, the ethical question of being in the wilderness, what, what our recommendation always is, is take your phone with you and put it on airplane mode. So for one thing, you're not being distracted by texts and phone calls. You can use it as a camera um, and it preserves battery because one of the things that we find is that, as Brian said, these calls come in late in the day. People have probably been posting pictures on social media, talking to their friends, or in areas where there's poor cell coverage, it really burns through your battery right. just trying to find, find the signal. Data. Yeah. So put it on airplane mode. If you need to use it, turn it on, then turn it back off again. Um, because battery life is, is a big issue for us. Mm -hmm. I would say more often than not, somebody's phone goes dead between the time they call for help and the, by the time we're able to get to them. And that's very frustrating on our part. Yeah. So in, we've got a couple minutes left. What are the things that everybody should have with them now when they go out? I bet they're the same things they have always been, but <laughs> let's see. <laughs> Brian, I'll start with you. Um, well, they need, to, they need to start out by knowing where they're park, they park their car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if not the trailhead, at least the town. Yeah. Uh, they need extra clothing, even when it's 95 degrees, hazy, hot, and humid. It's going to be cold by the time we get to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they need food. They need water. Uh, they, it, a rule on our team is you need to be able to survive 24 hours and come out intact. And when we all hike, that's the rule that we abide by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Brian said, you know, many of these calls um, could be avoided if somebody had something as simple as a headlamp. Mm -hmm. Right, the number of calls that we get that I just got dark, I can't see my way down, I think I may have gotten off the trail, and really all we end up doing is walking up the trail and walking them back out again. Mm -hmm. We had an incident up on Hunger Mountain a couple of years ago where um, somebody went up to see the sunset, that was the intent of their hike on Mount Hunger, and didn't bring a flashlight with them. So <laughs> it's like, what happens when you watch the sunset? Well, the sun goes down, it gets dark, but. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, a response of taking people away from their families at night and dinner time and hiking up the mountain and bringing them back down. So a lot of things could be avoided just with kind of common sense. Uh, the other two things I would add, which isn't so much bringing things with them, um, but telling somebody where you're going uh, and when you expect to be back. Mm -hmm. Uh, because to get a call from a family member that a friend went out backcountry skiing or hiking and hasn't come back yet, if they don't know where they went, we have chased all over the state looking for people's cars, trying to figure out where they are. That's and that's just, um, you know, not good use of everybody's time. So Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you. One more quick thing. Is there a, is there a central website people can go to to, to get information about backcountry search and rescue and so we have there is a website uh, called hike safe um, that is a joint program it actually started in New Hampshire mm -hmm. uh, with Fish and Game in the White Mountain National Forest and uh, the state of Vermont has kind of bought into that and participates in that program and there's a lot of really good information about um, kind of uh, hiking safely and some resources on where to go for trail information and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say in Vermont, the other great resource is the Green Mountain Club. Mm -hmm. So either calling or going to their website, a lot of great information there as well. Great. Well, thank you, Neil Van Dyke and Brian Linder. I appreciate your time today. It's been really interesting. Good. So, Thanks, Steve. Yeah. And thank you for watching another episode of Into the Issues. Uh, look forward to presenting another show to you again soon. Thanks for watching.